Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 13 Adrift Later that day, after the Chancellor had begun evacuating his forces from Esmeralda, about 20 miles southwest, just a few miles below Tansupa, Trevor, Beck, and the two kids were making their way on foot, seeking a vehicle, in order to continue their journey. They were all carrying their individual packs of supplies the same ones they had taken from Gonzalez's truck just one night earlier, while they made their way through the thicket. As they had earlier planned, they kept cover under the nearby jungle, while maintaining a close enough distance to the highway to keep a lookout for any possible working vehicles. It had been several hours since their last vehicle had run out of fuel, and also since they had heard any overhead aircraft in the area. It was nearing afternoon, and throughout the day they had encountered slim showers from the dense storm moving over the coast. The sporadic rain had left the soil damp and had slightly slowed their pace as they made their way through the thick coastal woodlands. It was bright enough to see, but there was no evidence of any sun as the overcast skies evenly lit up their surroundings in a seemingly permanent state of the most eerie dull haze. Through these dense jungles, cloudy rays of light were chaotically distributed throughout the vegetation, but were slowly darkened the further in they went. It's getting late, Trevor. I think they might need a break, Beck remarked as Caleb, just behind her, gave his thoughts on the matter. I'm hungry, he sighed as he stayed close behind his aunt. Trevor stopped and looked back at the two small kids. He then gave his sister a glance as if to tell her to join in on his plan as he turned to Caleb and Delilah once more and began to ease their growing impatience. Listen, guys. We really don't want to be out here when it gets dark. It would be better if we found a car before then, even if that means just one we could shelter in for the night. As soon as we see something, we'll figure out what to do about some food, okay? He looked at Beck as they both were growing very aware of the fact that they were now without anyone but the four of them. No food. And no water. Something had to change. They needed to find something. Anything. Delilah chimed in, right after Trevor's plea to the group, and stunned both him and Beck. There's a small truck near the next highway marker. A blue one. 
it has enough gas to get us to the salvation. Immediately, the other three were peering into the direction that Delilah was pointing in. As Trevor trained his eyes into the distance that Delilah had pointed him in, he responded. You mean the small kilometer markers on the sides of the road? He questioned while letting out a small laugh. Delilah, how would you know that? Delilah smiled at Trevor and proudly answered his question. Kit told me. Trevor then laughed and looked over at his sister, receiving a small smile from her. Then he looked back at Delilah. And who is Kit? Delilah looked down at the ground, as if to suddenly become shy as she posed her answer in a softer voice. My friend. Trevor and Beck gave each other a look, as they both thought it was pleasantly nice that Delilah had such an imagination in such a dark moment like the one they had all currently found themselves in. Their voices slowly trailed off as they carefully made their ways through the unforgiving South American jungles. Meanwhile, a ways up the road and a long, muddy hike through the wilderness, there, upon the shoulder of the narrow, desolate highway where the jungle wildlife met the pavement, sat a highway marker. And as a subtle mist began to take place, it wasn't long before four silhouettes began to appear within the trees and flowing ivy not too far from the shoulder of the road they were staying near. Beck and Trevor continued to keep a close eye out for anything they could remotely identify as a source of transportation, or even a place to get out of the rain from the growing monsoons above. That's the one, Delilah quietly shouted. Trevor and Beck looked at each other. Beck was now walking at the head of the group, and Trevor was picking up the rear. Then Beck, looking at the marker, entertained Delilah's imagination. So, where's the small truck your friend told you about? Over there, Delilah casually answered as she pointed into the jungles, just to the other side of the highway. Beck and Trevor smiled at each other as they looked over to where Delilah had pointed. But then, as they stood there and looked into the dense vegetation across the road, their smiles slowly faded as they each squinted their eyes slightly attempting to make sense of what they were now seeing. As they both looked on, sure enough, just as the little girl had so simply put, something was there, barely peeking through the leaves within the wilderness. They weren't able to make out much, just a metallic surface of some type showing through the jungle's thicket. A small opening as the apparent side paneling of a possible vehicle shone with a slight bluish color. Trevor and Beck now gave each other a confused look. Then, both at the same time, looked over at Delilah with even more confusion. Delilah, when did you talk to Kit? Beck asked. Both Trevor and Beck now looked at Delilah with anticipation in their eyes. They knew that they couldn't be too careful, and they weren't exactly sure who this Kit character was. Were they someone she had talked to from Vuelta Larga? Was this some kind of twisted trick? One of Santiago's traps he set before he was killed? How did she know this? And who is Kit? They had to be careful. But they also knew they were running out of options. And they couldn't simply walk away from this current windfall. Several hundred feet away, within the trees, sat a blue truck. A vehicle so hidden that if Delilah hadn't said anything, it would not have been discovered. Suddenly, footsteps could be heard approaching as a large crack in the middle of the windshield reflected what little light the stormy skies above had to offer. As the footsteps made their way around the vehicle, a man began surveying his surroundings, seeing if anyone was close by. It was Trevor, and he was now alone. He looked at the vehicle, studying it for any suspicious attributes. It was a much older vehicle, which looked like it was just recently hidden. It was rusting in several places with a mostly intact yet fading blue painted surface. The small SUV housed five seats within it and had various items inside, seeming to belong to its owner. It wasn't much, just some maps and tools and other various belongings. Then he noticed the back seats littered with empty water bottles. Suddenly, 
Chuba heard footsteps behind him. He quickly spun around, and there, just a few feet away from him, stood a young Hispanic male. Trevor froze. The man he now looked at was well within striking distance, and he didn't want to initiate a confrontation. The man, now facing him, wore torn blue jeans, a white undershirt, and a thick khaki corduroy jacket. The man seemed unfaded by Trevor, which struck him as odd. He wasn't quite sure what the man was capable of. He wasn't sure if he had any weapons he might soon brandish. And most importantly, as he checked his surroundings with his peripherals, he wasn't sure if this man had any nearby friends that would be joining them. Then, to Trevor's shock, without saying a word, the man simply walked past Trevor, past the vehicle, and into the jungle, leaving Trevor slightly panicked and now confused. He turned and peered through the back window of the small truck, across the interior, and out the opposite window, where he could see the man stumbling about as he seemed to pointlessly wander into the woods. Trevor then noticed the man pull from his coat pocket a bottle of water as the man quickly threw back the remaining liquid inside. And that was when Trevor lowered his gaze to the back seat of the vehicle where several more empty water bottles lay. As bad as Trevor felt for the man, he knew it was too late for him as he kept an eye on where the stranger had disappeared. While doing this, he slowly reached for the front passenger door and began to open it as a few more water bottles fell to the forest floor. And there, in the ignition, was the vehicle's key. Meanwhile, Beck was crouched behind a rock near Delilah and Caleb. She was peering around it through her pair of binoculars. And then, after waiting some time, she saw Trevor emerge from the forest across the road, signaling her and the kids that the target had been acquired. As Trevor waited, he turned to the vehicle once more and muttered under his breath. Okay, let's get to work. And within a few moments, the vehicle sounded off, the four now inside as it slowly made its way up the muddy vegetation back to the nearby E-15, leaving in its wake a messy patch of consumed, tainted water bottles Trevor and Beck had removed before their departure. Once in full motion, the car made a large U-turn and continued down the highway. As it slowly disappeared, the calm stillness of the forest took hold of the vacant expressway as small drops of rain began descending on the quieting pavement. This thing is three quarters full, Trevor said, while behind the wheel as his face beamed with joy. This can get us all the way there. Beck smiled as she looked at her brother and then back at the kids. She reached into her bag and pulled out a thermos, gaining Trevor's attention. Isn't that the rainwater we collected earlier? I thought we used it all, he said, receiving a rather quick response from his sister. I refilled it from the runoff of a rock while we were waiting for you. She then reached back and handed the thermos to Caleb, who took his turn and quickly handed it over to Delilah. Upon pleasing the children and their thirst, Beck turned back around in her seat and once again reached down to her feet, this time pulling out a map they had been given the night before. We still have another 325 miles left to go. What is that, like eight hours? Beck asked her brother. Trevor thought about his sister's estimation and agreed with her. Yeah, something like that, maybe eight, nine at the most, I'd say. Beck thought to herself, reflecting on their current find. Although for years, Things really hadn't made much sense. However, this paled in comparison to the last couple of days. And he just walked away. Trevor had his answer ready. It didn't seem difficult to him. Yeah, he must have been bathing in the stuff. Jesus Christ, Beck stated. That could have been us. I drank a few of the bottles they gave me. Me too, Trevor remarked. She also said to stay off the highway, Delilah noted from the back seat. Once again, Trevor and Beck looked at each other. This time, they didn't laugh Delilah's comments off as pure imagination as Beck looked back at the small girl and posed a question. Who? Your friend? Kit? She asked. 
Delilah looked at Beck and laughed. Yes, she told me that, when she told me about the truck. Stay off the highway. Trevor and Beck looked at each other. Then they looked over at the impossibly thick jungle when Trevor finally chimed in. I think it's too thick for us to drive through, sweetie. With this rain, we might even get stuck. Delilah looked out the window at the darkening wilderness. She was recently in herself. As she let her eyes wander, for a quick and fleeting moment, she noticed a darkened figure within the trees as she responded to Trevor. Yeah, plus I don't like it in there. It's scary. Trevor and Beck, however, weren't letting it go as easily as the small child in the back seat, sitting next to her brother, had done. They looked at each other silently, wondering how accurate this little girl's friend just might be. Trying to shake it off, convincing themselves that their vehicle they'd found wasn't a product of some imaginary friend, and instead was just an amazing coincidence. And knowing that the dense jungles on either side seemed to pose much more risk, they both looked off into the distant road ahead, wondering what their journey had in store. As they proceeded down the highway, the afternoon sun was now beginning to make its descent, announcing to the earth below a cold and rainy evening was on the way. Some rays of sunlight began beaming through the overcast skies, creating refractions of light through the rain, which formed a dispersion of different shades of colors across the skies above. The four made their way down the E-15 as a state of ease pleasantly swept through their newly acquired vehicle. You should try to get some rest back while I'm driving. Then we can take shifts. Sounds good to me. Wake me up when we're halfway. The conversation then slowed as the four travelers continued their journey south. That evening, when the sun was beginning to set, tucking itself in for the night within the distant Pacific horizon, the kids were asleep as Beck watched the beautiful colors in the sky change from vibrant oranges and reds to muted purples and pinks. She watched as the overcast skies simply turned dark without a star in the sky as a dull full moon lit up the curtain of clouds below it. Trevor had been sleeping now for almost three hours. Beck felt as if they were making good time. After all, they still had a day and a half left and they were only about an hour from their target. Trevor had a tendency to toss and turn in his sleep, which is why she could tell he needed the rest as his motionless body lay curled up next to her, almost completely silent. While she drove, she pondered the recent weeks. She thought of her grandfather. She remembered sitting on his lap when she was just a little girl. She remembered visiting him at his lake house and sitting on the dock with her younger brother. She remembered showing him how to properly skip a smooth stone across the water's surface. How to throw it just right. A delicate flick of the wrist as the stone would sail off, gracefully bouncing along its glassy path, ultimately sinking into the water itself. She then thought of Anne and Eugene, how they were such a driving force within their small team, how they lucked upon them when she was taken by a group of Russians. Anne was always pretty quiet, but she was always ready to help wherever it was needed. And Eugene, his expertise with computers and electronics had come in handy through some of their most dire moments. Then, as she was deep in thought, her eyes began to well up as an image of Seth slowly crossed her mind. Watching the sheer and utter painful death he had gone through right before her very eyes, unable to do anything about it. Then, as the road in front of her began to slowly darken, she snapped out of her gloomy days, while the last sliver of sunlight cued her to turn on her high beams, lighting up the pavement as they made their way through the small coastal town of Montanita. A large bend of freeway laid in front of her as she began to calculate how much gas they would need to complete their trip. She felt they had less than an hour to travel and had about an eighth of a tank. 
She smiled as she felt confident this amount of fuel should be just enough to get them through. Just then, she noticed a dark void on the freeway about a half mile ahead. Since they began, it wasn't rare to come across abandoned cars here and there. But now, with the lack of light, this felt much different. She knew she was just being paranoid, so she didn't bother waking her brother while she let her foot off the gas slightly and decreased her speed. She wanted to get a closer look at the object in the road ahead, and she figured she could do this if she maintained a lower speed. Going now about 55 miles an hour, the object was getting closer, and her paranoia was fading as she did not see anything out of the ordinary. The obstacle seemed to be in the middle of the freeway, not uncommon, however slightly nerve-wracking as darkness settled around her. About quarter mile or so to go before surpassing the incoming hurdle, Beck's confidence swept back in as she was now close enough to see with her headlights that a threat seemed unlikely. Then, as a sweet and sour medley of flavors would jar one's taste, so did Beck's emotions as her confidence swiftly turned to apprehension. Suddenly, without warning, their blue Suburban was flooded in light from the vehicles ahead. She began to break as panic set in. Thoughts began to flood her mind as the loudest thought directed her next choice. She needed to wake her brother. As she began to let her brother's name fall from her lips, she heard an echoing, piercing sound come from the distance. She attempted to swerve and avoid the threat from the familiar sound but immediately felt a cold sensation flood her body while the shattering of glass sounded before her as she was forced back against her seat, while the world around her slowly turned dark. The truck's front wheels made an immediate and sudden shift to the right, joined with the 50 miles an hour it had been traveling, and catapulted itself across the few lanes of blacktop. Flipping itself into a tumble, it landed back on its tires and drifted to the side of the road, smacking into a tree. The chaotic sounds abruptly ended as steam from within the engine began bellowing out of its loosened hood's frame. Trevor slowly began coming to while regaining his focus. His balance gave him a sensation of unease as he slowly realized that the vehicle was at an extreme slant. He felt his forehead as he noticed a new gash. His fingers passed while sliding them across his face. Looking through his bloody and blurry vision, he peered at his own blood on his hands that he had swept from his brow. He looked over at his sister, who was pressed up against her door. Beck, he whispered, unable to speak any louder from the strange pains he now felt across his entire body. Beck, are you... Are you okay, Beck? But, not hearing her answer, he slowly raised his head in an attempt to see her face through his bloodied and blurry vision. As he scanned his sister pressed up against the driver's side door, he called to her once more. Beck, but then, trying to focus on her face, now coming into view as he strained his eyes while attempting to ignore the pulses of pain now surging through his head his heart began to sink once more. And there, upon her face, a gaping, blackened wound replacing the area where her left eye had once been. An apparent bullet hole now fixed upon his sister's brow. And as he began to muster up his strength to try to call her name one last time, his attention was drawn to his right side, just outside his door. Still in shock and tremendous pain, he managed to look over and noticed, standing outside the vehicle, now with no window separating himself from the open air, a man darkened by the night and the surrounding woods. There was no time for any reaction, as he heard the man quickly say something that seemed to rattle in his mind, not making any sense, as he saw the butt of a rifle approach his head. A gift from my dad, motherfucker. With that, the rifle's end made a heavy impact with his forehead as everything around him seemed to fade away, while an icy hot sensation rang through his skull.
were dark over the Atlantic seas, while flashes of lightning flickered within their misty confines of the nearby heavy clouds. A few United States F-16s made their way through the murky atmosphere while closely monitoring their surroundings as they escorted the large Boeing 747, also known as Air Force One, through the murky and stormy night skies. Without a specific agenda at hand, Several top officials held an intensively heated security briefing regarding the recent atrocities that had occurred upon their nation's soil. A very well-lit area, near the nose of the plane and underneath the cockpit, was a room dressed in mahogany walls and brass trimmings, as a vociferous debate continued to unfold within its walls. Around a large oak table within the heavenly oval office, sat President Letitia Jackson, a well-spoken, older African-American woman within her third year in office. Her wavy, strikingly jet-black hair was held back by a clip behind her head as she held a serious expression while demanding answers for the latest security failures. She had dark skin, which helped highlight her piercing hazel eyes, while she carried a confidence with her that had a record of sparking results as she demanded strategy from the team around her. Sitting across from her, Vice President Stephen Brady, a much younger Caucasian man with blonde hair and green eyes, sat quietly awaiting his turn to be addressed. Next to him sat a man that the White House had been closely working with for several years. His name was Alex Channing, and he was the nation's leading contagion expert. Behind these two gentlemen, stood several high-ranking military personnel. Among them was the most decorated of them all, the General of the Air Force, General Casey Beckett, who was currently under attack by the President's stern accusations. General Beckett, you had assured my staff that Dark Scope, while still in its test phase, would be safe to use as long as we had specific targets and we manually overrode the AI to maintain control of each individual warhead. With all due respect, General, these reports don't convey the same message," Letitia stated as she pored over the documents, freshly printed and now strewn across her desk. She continued to publicly admonish the high-ranking officer as she proceeded with a lecturing tone. New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, DC, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Rio de Janeiro, the list goes on and on. These are not targets recorded in the briefing just several hours ago. The targets that were ordered were intended to be centered over large military operations within the Russian and Chinese borders. Instead, even though severely crippling them, we are literally being plummeted into the Dark Ages, as we've apparently systematically wiped out our entire continent's power grid, leveling our largest cities and military strongholds and who knows the fallout this will create. Power grids across the entire planet are likely to be wiped out, General. This is exactly what the Russian and Chinese militaries needed to gain the advantage, chaos. Beckett immediately interrupted to fortify a quick defense as he pointed to one of the documents on the President's desk. Yes, Madam President, I fully understand your frustration. However, these are not our codes. While they are still within the guidelines of the Department of Defense's formatting, they are simply not ours. It's as if another component tampered with the codes before reaching Dark Scope's apparatus. The AI is simply unable to override any authentic manual commands. He answered as he began to inform the President of his department's assessment on the breach. 
We have successfully tracked the backlogs of the program and found a code inside it that has been laying there for years. It's not Russian or Chinese. We thought it might be Iranian, but then we came across this, he said as he rifled through the clutter of pages on the desk between them. This isn't the first time we've come along this dialect. Several years ago, one of my men sent a transmission like this over to headquarters before he was forced to self-detonate deep underground in one of our South American labs. Zancudo. At that point, Mr. Channing spoke up. My brother, Salvador, was with him, Madam President. He died in that blast. He'd been studying the specimen there for several years. Madam President, we believe this to be the same dialect as my brother's specimen. They were able to triangulate coordinates of the specimen's origin through ongoing sessions and decoding. Our hacker appears to be from a small planet, Darius of Alpha Centauri. As the president closed her eyes, a sense of helpless anger became apparent to the officials around her as the general began to speak once again. This wasn't the most disturbing information we discovered, Madam President. The hacker had localized technical support. Our intel led us to these two men. It came from an informant we made several years ago. A contact we have yet to contain, so we're not sure exactly what their motive is. We're just certain that her information is always accurate. He said, as he took out a couple photographs and placed them on the desk before the president, and continued. Thanks to this informant's information, the CIA and FBI were closing in on these targets, but they had no reason to execute their mission as they were yet to see any illegal motives for their activities. Until now. Madam President, these were two of the most high-ranking officers in the CIA before they moved on to being private contractors. We believe they are now working closely with the hostile outsiders. And last, but not least, we recently received this. The general pulled out another paper from his pocket and placed it before her. It's their last transmission monitored by the two cooperating agencies. The president looked at the transcript, which was obviously printed from a fax machine, and then posed a question. What do we know about this informant? The general then answered, we're not sure of her affiliation or rank, but she goes by some kind of code name. At least, that's what we're assuming. Calls herself Kit. President looked at the general with disappointment in her eyes as she read the words on the document before her, quietly, to herself. It had been addressed to a Mr. Shields and was from a man named Mr. Brooks. And it read, Mr. Shields, our client has advised me that there was a flaw inside the code within their virus. Apparently, a small percentage of the infected can identify the loss prevention agents known as cattle guards. I have provided you the defect of this weak spot in a disk you will soon receive. Once you run it through the database, it should allow you to identify and evaluate the targets. The client would like you to cull this population Eliminate the threat, Mr. Shields. Arlo. Beckett continued speaking as the presence of hair-raising energy began drifting through the plane's cabin. Both of these men are at the top of their pay grades. They are very hard to track and they work on a contractual basis with the CIA. They are even known to have body doubles around the world. Some say they're not exactly body doubles but some kind of mutation from a compound we've been briefed on called DX4. Whatever they are, they're even used on their own families, spending time with their kids and becoming intimate with their spouses. They wrote the playbook on the modern era of the espionage industry and have been crucial assets. However, it appears they are extremely ruthless. Letitia peered back to the photographs trying to connect the dots as the general continued speaking. Their names are Thomas Shields and Arlo Brooks. And this picture of Thomas Shields, although unbeknownst to the officials aboard Air Force One, 
was the same man that was once within Trevor's team, below them, on the ground. It was Seth's father. Scared.